On this Wednesday night, a controversial app and your concerns about your constitutional rights. Alarm bells about a Rive can. It creates direct harm for people who are receiving this incorrect notification. That calls for greater transparency and accountability. Amber alert over, where two missing Saskatchewan children were found and their condition now. A social media activist targeted by online harassers. They want me dead. Her wrongful arrest by police in Ontario. And the rise of exoskeletons. The sky's the limit. A BC man's sci-fi fantasy becomes a reality. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. The controversial Arrive Can app is facing more criticism tonight. Since it was launched in April of 2020, it has sparked hundreds of complaints from Canadians. It's been called unreliable, cumbersome, glitchy, and a barrier for those who are technically challenged. But now there are concerns the app may be violating Canadians' constitutionally protected rights. Our Mercedes Stevenson has more in our top story tonight. The Arrive Can app is the gateway to Canada. No app, no entry. You're supposed to be able to just fill out this form and breeze through the border. A lot of tears. There's been a lot of fear. Um, for no reason. But for thousands of fully vaccinated Canadians like Katie Lister, glitches and errors have resulted in false quarantine orders with real impacts on their lives. Getting daily, daily, tr three calls, sometimes four calls a day, including human officers who've not even go taken the time to go into my file and be like, oh shoot, she's triple vaccinated and she arrived on the 16th, she's fine. It's not just about the stress. Some data and privacy experts are warning the app could be violating Canadians' constitutional rights when it fails and wrongly quarantines people including the charter right to freedom of movement. We don't know. One expert thinks um, it could even people. rise to the level of unlawful detention. It creates direct harm for people who are receiving this incorrect notification and following it. And there's no... Law professor Charisma there's... Mathen has concerns about app glitches. It is an error, so mm -hmm. by definition, it's, it's not a justified infringement of your liberty. But Mathen says because the government has taken reasonable steps to try to resolve erroneous orders, she's not sure this rises to the level of a charter rights violation. A recent glitch affected approximately 10,000 Canadians, wrongly telling them to quarantine. Global News has learned it took the government nearly 12 days to inform people of that error. The experience has left lingering fears about the next border crossing for many. I'm fearful of going back to my own country when I shouldn't whatsoever. Um, I, 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 you know, I have these questions. Global News spoke with several Canadians, including Katie, who struggled to talk to a human to try to resolve the situation. And Farah, this relates some of the big issues, lack of oversight and transparency, the difficulty getting an error fixed with a person, and the use of artificial intelligence to make decisions about something as major as a quarantine without a human in the loop. I ran into this myself recently returning to Canada, but was fortunate to have mine resolved relatively quickly. Farah? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thank you, Mercedes. After a tense day and a half, there is good news to tell you about in the case of an Amber Alert issued for two missing children from Saskatchewan. Last night, the kids were found safe in South Dakota, while the man they were with, a convicted sex offender, is now in police custody. Global's Troy Charles has the latest. It was just after 7 p.m. Monday evening when RCMP issued the Amber Alert for two missing Saskatchewan children ages 7 and 8. Police were concerned because it was believed the children were in the company of a registered sex offender. Fast forward to Tuesday evening, that Amber Alert gets extended into South Dakota in the United States. RCMP say not long after that, law enforcement officials in South Dakota were able to safely locate the two children, their mother, and 50-year-old Benjamin Martin Moore in Sturgis, South Dakota. And just a reminder, we'll not be using any of the names or images of the children in this story to help protect their privacy. Benjamin Moore and the children's mother were taken into custody by the Meade County Sheriff's Department. In 2009, Moore was convicted of sexual interference with a minor and served two years in prison. Saskatchewan RCMP had issued a warrant for his arrest Tuesday for failing to report a change of resident, which is a requirement for convicted sex offenders. 
This ordeal began August 5th after social services asked RCMP to help with an investigation into Moore only to find their home in East End, Saskatchewan abandoned. RCMP say three days later they received an apprehension order from social services and the Amber Alert was sent. The group was located some 600 kilometers south of the Canadian border in Sturgis, South Dakota. Currently being held in Sturgis is the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, which is a 10-day event that brings motorcycle riders from across North America to South Dakota. More, the two children and their mother were found at a campsite where many motorcycle rally attendees were staying. The South Dakota Attorney General's office says there is no indication of any injuries and that the two children are being cared for as preparations are made to have them returned to their rightful custodian. Surely a huge sigh of relief for all those involved after a scary situation ends with two children avoiding any serious physical harm. Troy Charles, Global News. 22 people were arrested and are facing a string of more than 400 charges as police in Ontario dismantled a major cross-border gun and drug trafficking ring. York Regional Police say the investigation dubbed Project Monarch began last October and in late July, search warrants were executed at two dozen homes and businesses. Police seized 27 handguns along with more than 300 rounds of ammunition and high-capacity magazines. The guns are believed to have been illegally brought over from the U.S., more than $1.3 million worth of cocaine, heroin, fentanyl and other drugs were also seized. A popular transgender activist and online streamer is speaking out after being swatted. Swatting is when false threats are made to police, which trigger armed officers showing up at the unsuspecting victim's home. Clara Sorrenti says that's exactly what happened to her on Friday morning. Amar Khan has more on her terrifying experience and why she believes she was wrongfully arrested. Clara Sorrenti says a false email with her address was sent to London City Council claiming she had killed her mother and was intending to shoot people at City Hall who were straight. The email, Sorrenti says, had given out her real address and resulted in police with guns at her doorstep and her being arrested. When I went into the hallway, and then saw that assault rifle. I screamed and I, I thought I was going to die. London Police Service confirmed the arrest to Global News. They added Sorrenti was released without charges and they are continuing to analyze her electronic devices but could not offer any more information. Sorrenti says the hate she's been facing is because of her prominence as a trans woman and activist. Oh, they want me dead because I'm a high profile transgender activist. There's a big target on my back and for the past year, transgender people have been at the focal point of a culture war. It's not just the doxing, but Sorrenti takes issue with London Police Service's handling of the incident. Evidence bags she showed Global News indicates police use her dead name, the birth name she had before transitioning, which is considered highly offensive. She also claims police asked her if she was a she and to explain dead naming. The way that I was treated by the police really showed me they know nothing about transgender people or issues. Police told Global News that this is an active investigation, but despite being a prominent name online and having run for office provincially and federally, Sorrenti thinks police's actions are driven by ignorance. So I had a hate crime perpetrated against me, and instead of the police helping me, they victimized me for it. As for the trolls and hate mongers, Sorrenti says she remains undeterred. I'm not backing down. I know that the work I do is incredibly valuable and thousands of trans people have told me that. I have people almost every day saying they came out to their families because of me. And if they want me to stop the next time, they better manipulate the police into pulling the trigger. Amar Khan, Global News, London, Ontario. Patience is wearing thin in Newfoundland and Labrador as explosive wildfires keep growing. And a change in weather is expected tomorrow with winds predicted to shift. As Abigail Beeman reports, people in nearby communities are now being told to pack go bags and they're being warned to be prepared and ready to leave at a moment's notice. Along the newly reopened Beta Spare Highway, smoldering spots and burned out brush. 
The highway is open for now, but with the fires growing and winds expected to shift from the southwest, everyone is concerned about Thursday. The fact is that we have a fire that's over 17,000 hectares burning uncontrollably 25 kilometers from our community. So that's a serious situation. Warnings from officials in Grand Falls, Windsor and nearby communities have become stronger. The mayor wants everyone to pack a so-called go bag full of essentials and be ready to leave with an hour's notice. My bag is packed, it's by the door. Um, kennels are ready for the pets. Uh, snacks and stuff in the food or in the car for the kids. But otherwise, just kind of carrying on as usual. We're just playing it day by day and like say if we get the call to say that we have to evacuate while well, we're ready. Towns have been offering daily buses to transport people who want to leave, especially the vulnerable, to a shelter two hours away, but there hasn't been much uptake. Air crews and ground crews were out all day Wednesday tackling three fires in central Newfoundland. The biggest has grown to 17,000 hectares and Tuesday's rain wasn't enough. The water bombers in the Paradise Lake and Bay of Air, they're basically managing the two of those different incidents because they're really close in proximity. So if, if they see one flare up over in, on the other site, they'll go manage it and, and move back and forth that way. Officials believe the fires will grow larger before they can get the upper hand, but they're confident they will get them under control. When the wind changes tomorrow, it's going to be uh, it's going to be pretty smoky here, so probably unbearable. In the meantime, thousands of people are living on edge. Abigail Beban, Global News. There is better news for those in BC's southern interior. Some of the residents ordered to flee a raging wildfire received the all clear to return home today. Crews fighting the Karameas Creek wildfire and gaining the upper hand thanks to calmer conditions in recent days. Almost 500 properties remain on an evacuation order and more than 900 are on an evacuation alert. The wildfire has shrunk slightly to 6,700 hectares, but lightning and strong winds expected to arrive tonight could cause the wildfire to erupt. An alleged assassination plot thwarted. Coming up, why police believe former top White House advisors were targeted. The U.S. Justice Department says it's uncovered an international murder-for-hire plot led by a member of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. The alleged targets were members of then-President Donald Trump's cabinet and inner circle. As Jackson Prosco reports, the plot's believed to be retaliation for the 2020 assassination of a top Iranian commander. It was a 2020 U.S. drone strike that killed top Iranian General Qasem Soleimani after the Trump administration claimed the leader of Iran's Revolutionary Guard was plotting to attack U.S. embassies. By removing Soleimani, we have sent a powerful message to terrorists. Two and a half years later, Iran is allegedly still out for revenge. The U.S. Justice Department says it uncovered a plot by a member of the Revolutionary Guard to murder former U.S. officials. They say the suspect, based in Tehran, attempted to pay $300,000 to people in the U.S. to eliminate former National Security Advisor John Bolton and $1 million for an unspecified second job. Reports suggest the target was former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. This is an especially appalling example of the government of Iran perpetrating egregious acts of transnational violence. Iran is a rogue regime. Bolton was seen as one of the most hawkish members of the Trump White House. As architect of the maximum pressure campaign, he pushed to end the Iran nuclear deal. Pompeo was Secretary of State at the time and insisted Soleimani posed an imminent threat to the U.S. Qasem Soleimani himself was plotting a broad, large-scale attack against American interests. Just last month, a U.S. intelligence report warned Iran was still looking to avenge its slain general and could target current or former U.S. officials, up to and including former President Donald Trump. I understand that Iran does engage in this sort of action and behavior, and, and it does undercut security around the world and now including in places like the United States. Shocking but not surprising, the alleged plot may torpedo last-ditch efforts to salvage the Iran nuclear deal, where one of Iran's key demands is removing the Revolutionary Guard from the U.S. terrorist blacklist. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. 
And former U.S. President Donald Trump refused to answer questions from New York prosecutors today, repeatedly invoking his Fifth Amendment right to silence during a scheduled deposition connected to an investigation into whether the Trump organization misled tax authorities by providing false and fraudulent financial statements. Trump says he declined to answer the questions under the rights and privileges afforded to every citizen under the United States Constitution. And as it turns out, Monday's FBI raid at Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate State may be a consequence of a bill Trump signed into law as president in 2018, making it a felony to mishandle classified information. That law was created as a piece of Trump's campaign against Hillary Clinton. Ahead, danger close to fears over Europe's biggest nuclear plant caught in Russia's war on Ukraine. Foreign ministers from Canada and other G7 nations have issued a joint statement calling for Russia to hand back control of Europe's largest nuclear power plant to Ukraine. The calls come amid new rounds of shelling, both in the region surrounding the plant and in Russian-occupied Crimea, signaling a possible new front in the months-long war. Redmond Shannon reports. Ukrainian authorities say 13 people died in airstrikes on the city of Marhanets Tuesday night, just 15 kilometers from Europe's largest nuclear power plant. The site at Zaporizhia has been occupied by Russia since March and has seen shelling too, including over the past weekend. Both sides accuse each other. Ukraine says Russia is using the plant as a cover to fire rockets, with the potential for a disaster far worse than the Chernobyl meltdown 36 years ago. Because in Chernobyl it was only one unit. Here you have uh, six units, six reactors. G7 foreign ministers echoed UN concerns Wednesday in a joint statement asking Russia to hand back control of all nuclear power plants in Ukraine saying the occupation is significantly raising the risk of a nuclear accident or incident and endangering the population of Ukraine, neighboring states and the international community. Meanwhile, far behind Russian lines in annexed Crimea, there is no finger pointing about Tuesday's huge explosions there. Russia says it was just an ammunition accident at one of its air bases. Kyiv is saying little, but reports Wednesday suggest Ukrainian special forces were behind the attack, one that could mark an important new front line in the conflict. President Vladimir Zelensky didn't reference the blasts, but he did issue a new red line, saying Crimea must be returned to Ukraine if the war is to end, something he has previously stopped short of doing. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Dozens of people are feared to have died off the coast of Greece after a boat carrying as many as 80 migrants and refugees sank overnight. The Coast Guard says 29 men were rescued after the ship capsized and sunk near the southeastern Greek island of Karpathos. The rescued men from Afghanistan, Iran and Iraq say the vessel had left from Turkey and it was heading toward Italy with 60 to 80 people aboard. Greece's Navy and Air Force joined rescue efforts, but officials say there has been no sign of some 50 people who are still missing. Dramatic new images illustrating the increasing desperate drought situation gripping large parts of Europe. The water level on the Rhine River has dropped so low it's causing major bottlenecks and it's forced some of the larger ships and barges that ply the river to a standstill. The cost of delivering freight on the river has increased fivefold. Near Barcelona, a 9th century church that had been underwater for hundreds of years has now re-emerged from a reservoir. In central Spain, the water level in the Sijara Reservoir has dropped to just 16% of its capacity. Parts of the Iberian Peninsula are at their driest in 1,200 years. The future gears up. Next, the BC man turning a sci-fi staple into a real competition. If you're a science fiction nerd, chances are you've dreamt of piloting a giant robot. Well, a BC engineer has got something pretty close. He and his firm have already built the world's largest four-legged exoskeleton mech suit. And they're just getting started. As Mike Drolet reports, they're hoping to create one very metal sport. Okay. 
See what she's got. It's not difficult to see where Jonathan Tippett drew the inspiration for his exoskeleton. Who wouldn't want to pilot one of these? But oddly enough, it wasn't movies that got the mechanical engineer's wheels turning. It was a 2003 trip to the Burning Man Festival in the Nevada desert. There, he looked at the giant sculpture and said, why not? We see a future or, or imagine and envision a future where mech suits, powered mech suits are as common as ATVs. Almost 20 years after his Burning Man inspiration, the science fiction dream is no longer fiction. In fact, at 4,000 kilos and 10 feet tall, his creation is now in the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest tetrapod exoskeleton in the world. It also pointed to the fact that maybe we made it a little too big. <laughs> the next generation's gonna be about two thirds the size. Half the weight, three or four times the power, like way more fierce, way more sporty, um, easier to transport, easier to get in and out of, easier to learn. And now that he's proven what's possible, he set his sights on the sporting world. Let the bot battle begin! Think about a cross between battle bots and the world's strongest man competitions. A mech racing league where athletes overcome obstacles and solve physical puzzles, without the violence, of course. Beyond that, who knows? You could use them in all sorts of applications, mining, agriculture, search and rescue, disaster response, um, forestry, you know, the sky's the limit. A mech suit is about as useful as a human, but amplified 50 times. And just imagine the potential when he figures out how to build opposable thumbs. Microlight Global News, Toronto. Next generation will be Iron Man, I think. And that's Global National for this Wednesday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and on behalf of our whole team here, I wanted to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is this pot of pelicans at A.E. Wilson Park in Regina. We love seeing your Canada, so please keep emailing us your pictures to viewers at globalnational.com. Until I see you tomorrow, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night.